Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 19 of the Saturday Morning Gaming Show. It is June 20th, 2020, and I'm your co-host, The Fat Wizard, joined today by... Alamaxia. And Lobos. And today we're playing the PC classic, Quest for Glory, So You Want to Be a Hero. So this was released in 1989, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So the original EGA version, which was text parsing only, was 1989. But we're actually playing the VGA remake... And that's even more complicated as well, as the floppy disk came out in 1992, and then the CD version came out in 1994. So we're going to call this 1989 for release, but it's really kind of a couple different releases here. But before we get into the game, gents, this is probably uh, up there on my top 10 of all time, but I know I'm super biased. So let's get a fresh take on the game. What did you both think about it? Uh, let's start with Alamaxia. Had a really tough time getting into it. I uh, I had not played a game like this um, anywhere near like this where I had to choose the different actions to interact with the people. Um, like I could talk to them or I could directly interact with them or move my character around. So that this was very new to me. So I had to learn how to approach this, ty- this type of game. Uh, once I kind of... Hit, honestly used a bit of a walkthrough but started with that walkthrough figured out how to approach it put the walkthrough away had a great time with it i definitely plan to play the second one good to hear how about you lobos i had uh the kind of the opposite effect where i i, I started off great and then eh, it's it's kind of how you do with these games though towards the end things just get kind of crazy with how how much what you have to try where and all the yeah their their final levels are always kind of insane <laughs> but no i loved it i, I thought it was really cool yeah. and i'm really excited to see to, to hear about like the differences between the playthroughs yeah yeah and so this is a a, a point and click adventure game but what i really really love so i i played a lot of those point and click adventure games like you know monkey island king's quest space quest but this was very unique in that it actually rolls some some like rpg mechanics mm-hmm. into it so mm-hmm. Let's let's start off talking about the different classes. At the beginning of the game, you can pick between three different classes. It's the I think it's the warrior is what mm-hmm. it's called. Yep. And then the thief and then the wizard. And they all come with different skills. Um and and then you can put po- put some points into allocating. So for instance, you 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 name your character and then you have 50 points and you have like things like strength dexterity um magic and a couple other sets of uh, luck is one of them and so those directly influence how your character actually solves puzzles which i loved and kind of got me into role-playing games (laughs) did you guys uh find that an interesting mechanic here uh i did definitely because you know i've played quite a few point and click adventures and usually you you have uh, your character, maybe you have different characters and they have actual different paths that they take, play through paths. But this was approaching the same game with different ideas. And later on, near the end, when I was starting to use uh, just a, a guide just to get me through <laughs> whatever you have to do there, uh, it was interesting to read like how, here's what warriors do and here's what thieves yeah. do and here's what wizards do. And I'm like, wow, those are completely different solutions but uh, all all work the same. It's cool. So we did all choose three different. Uh, each of us chose different classes. So I, I, I have a correction for the classes. They're actually fighter, magic user, and thief. So Lobos, mm. I believe you took fighter, right? I did. Yes. I took magic user, and Alamaxia took thief. And uh, in the first one, they do diverge a little bit. Like uh, Alamaxia. We don't have this in the video, but maybe you'll walk us through some of the thieving stuff. And I think the fighter, you, you have to um, have to kill a bunch of different enemies. Did you do that, Lobos? Um, there were a lot of times where I was like, oh, okay, a puzzle to get into this door. But it ended up, you just attack the door and it breaks it down. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, nice. <laughs> all right. And then the magic user, you go, uh, you get to play a little bit of a wizard's game. And we do have that in the video here. So with this being sort of an RPG game, you can grind up your stats. So how many people here, raise hands, 
How many people here picked up rocks by the handfuls and just started chucking them around to build up their throwing skill? Oh, I did not. I didn't even... Oh, really? I don't think there was a point where I considered having a higher throwing skill. Ooh. Mm. Okay, we can talk about some of the places that's (laughs) useful as we we get them here. So uh, let's talk about how the game starts. You are a hero, and you... You walk into this little town. It's uh, it's the area is called Spielberg, it's a, a right. barony of Spielberg, and and I think this game has a lot of references, a lot of puns. <laughs> so it's very possible they're talking like Steven Spielberg. Yeah, uh, but it, a little bit hard to tell. And you go in and you talk to the sheriff and his his goon named Otto, and Otto is playing with a um, with a yo yo. And it's kind of just real chill, you know. It's a it's a quaint little village. You think of, you know, the typical what sixteen hundred style hamlet outside of the the the, the barony there. And uh, so there's a couple side streets here, and you know there's a couple stores like a dry goods store, a magic store, an adventurers guild. Just very very chill town. And then after that, I actually went into the inn. Where did you guys go when you started? The inn was my first destination, but in the uh, starting area where you're talking to Sheriff and Otto, I probably spent a lot more time in that one screen than any other screen in the game (laughs) because I was just very meticulously reading all of their dialogue. And when I was sitting there just kind of Talking, talking with um, my wife for a moment, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Otto, as he's playing with his yo-yo, he flung his yo-yo off and it like bounced off of, off of something and hit my character in the head and went back to his yo-yo. <laughs> yeah. He does a couple trick shots like that. I, I, I thought that was really neat that I'm just sitting here completely idle, not paying attention. All of a sudden, my character gets hit in the head by a, a yo-yo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So going back to the inn, you said you went in there. You go in there and you 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 hear about uh, a man named Abdullah, and he looks to be from um, sort of like the a Persian area. If you think of something like the Prince of Persia, it's very, very, um, you know, very on point with that mm. that um, that getup, and that's actually a reference to the second game. But he. He basically had a merchant wagon and they got attacked by bandits. And so that's sort of setting up the scene here as there's bandits that have taken over the valley and sort of blocked off the entrance. I think there's also a snowfall that has blocked off routes in and out of town. Hmm. And so it's like, hey, yeah, we just need a hero here to 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 save our our town or, you know, or do good. But there's not a you don't go in there and you're like, oh, here's what I need to do. I need to do X, Y, Z. You kind of discover the little things that you need to do, and they all kind of funnel up into one big plot point. But I like that they they seem like they're very divergent quests that you go on, right? You go into the Adventurer Guild, and there's like four or five different things, and they don't seem like they're connected, but they most of them are. Mm-hmm. But uh, kind of continuing on in the town here we just entered the magic shop here and uh we're meeting a character named zara and this is where we you realize that magic users have familiars you know it's a very very classic like D esque mm. uh a situation here now this this place probably wasn't very useful for you folks they sell <laughs> a couple pills and potions and stuff but for the most part this is where you as a magic user get a couple spells you get like the fetch spell which allows you to pick up something from far away, a firebolt spell, which kind of shoots fire. Um, but I suspect you guys didn't get a, a lot of use out of this particular room, right? Uh, I walked in and talked to her and then left and never came back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't uh, put any points in the magic, so I walked in and uh, talked to her, and I looked at pretty well everything in the room. Um, yeah, that, lots of stuff to look at. A ton of stuff. And, and that is one thing I really have to commend the developers on is their attention to detail as well as the fun detail they put in that detail. So there's very a tongue in cheek, right? Very tongue in cheek. And there's even some cases where you'll look at the same thing multiple times and it'll give you different descriptions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. The one thing you do actually learn from Zara is you you hear about this 
powerful spellcaster named Irana. And Irana has cast some sort of aura around the town and is protecting it. Now, she didn't get the whole thing. There's a couple alleys uh, that that are in the, the town that are actually quite dangerous. Mm. And uh, as, as a thief, I'm sure Al Maxi will be able to tell us about those. Mm-hmm. But um, we hear this a couple times about Irana, and, and we actually learn more about her as we go to a little north of the town as Arana's, I think it was called Arana's Peace. Did you guys find that? Not only uh, found yeah. Arana's like, Peace. It's, it's like a little, uh, it's a place with a tree and it's kind of a... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The flowers and yeah, stuff. The yeah, it's like... Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. remember that. That was my yep, favorite so, uh, room in the whole game. <laughs> it's so... The music is so good. It's so, good, yeah, and, but that. it's also safety and where you can yes. sleep. So. <laughs> yeah. It's very regenerate. Mm-hmm. Now we're just walking in here to the Adventurers Guild and let's talk a little bit about the score in this game. So when you start, you have a score of 0 out of 500 mm-hmm. and a lot of the Sierra Adventure games would have scores. So as you would complete tasks, you would get some points. So for instance, you can sign the Adventurers book or Adventurers log and you basically say like, here, you know, the... You know, your character's name is signed the book and you get like a point or two. And those are some points are, are, are optional. And so you can actually beat the game without a full 500 points. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and sometimes sometimes you get more points for actually solving a puzzle like more correctly. Mm. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting to, to go back and play and like, OK, well, how did I miss like, you know, 15 points or, you know, did I really explore everything? Yeah, that's cool. But um did you have to use the Adventurers Guild? I think I think this guy uh, for a warrior, he kind of like gives you missions to collect animal parts from animals. Is that right, Lobos? Ah, uh, if he did, I didn't do that. So I found okay. the Adventurers Guild late because um, you walk to the left of the first screen, but if you didn't try it, there wasn't really a big indication that you could keep walking that way. Besides getting oh, hints, yeah, yeah. hints that there is more to the town. But uh, so it wasn't until maybe like day two or three that I actually wandered over there, talked to him, went through everything. And I was like, OK, but I didn't really get tasked with too much from being over there. OK, OK. Uh, so we we kind of explored the town here and now we're leaving out of the town. And when you first leave the town there's a little jingle that uh that plays it's it's very heroic it's you know you really feel like you're going on an adventure so i'm not sure if you guys saw that but it's something that i always love i've played this game many times <laughs> but you can head up to the castle but before you get to the castle there is an inn not an inn uh like a healer's hut mm. and there is a bird's nest there yeah did you guys uh get the item in the bird's nest I did. So I saw I saw that it was up there and there was a bird being really annoying. So I threw a rock at it and it ran away. Yeah. And then I saw a shiny. And then you go into the healer's hut and you talk to the healer and she mentions that she's missing an item. Um, mm-hmm. And there was something that... I don't know if she alluded to the fact that it might be in the tree, but she has a bird pet that's also yeah. there. So yeah, put, She mentioned she actually has, I think, two birds. Yeah. Well, she she oh, mentions okay, okay. that... Uh, the bird outside is her pet's girlfriend. Right. And yeah. and the way I kind of saw it is, oh, maybe this little pet took her ring thinking, oh, I'm going to propose to my girlfriend. And the girlfriend <laughs> took it yeah. and put it in her nest. Yeah. So you got it. Okay. So you threw a rock at the, the bird to scare it. But how did you actually retrieve the ring? Um, I don't know if I just was stubborn about it, but I... Uh... I, I kept I just climbed up the tree and I kept climbing okay. and you would fail, but yeah. you could keep climbing and eventually you'd get tired and but you could rest and you could keep climbing and you I noticed that my climb skill was going up. So I just kept doing yeah, it. Yeah, you just keep doing yeah. it. Eventually you get up and then and then you get up to the top and then you, I think you have to use is it your dexterity to actually climb across the the bow of the the tree to get the ring some yeah I f- i'm assuming I you fell, fell a, a couple lot. times yeah, yeah. <laughs> now how about you alamaxia how did you get it after i fell once or twice i thought it was uh, more related to my climbing so i climbed up and down the tree a good 30 40 more times and uh then i was, I was able to get the ring 
But there's something so satisfying about seeing those numbers go up and you, and you can see the progress. You're like, because they actually have multiple stages of the climbing. It's like, oh, you got a little bit higher this time before mm-hmm. you fell, right? And you're like, oh, man, this is cool. Yeah. It's like a cookie clicker. You're just like, I'm doing uh-huh. my thing. Yeah. I'm making progress. I feel yeah. accomplished. <laughs> so for, as the wizard, you can use the fetch skill. Yeah. And the fetch will will actually get it. So as I know that there's three ways to get it. You can throw rocks and maybe daggers at it. You can throw a dagger. And you can you can't throw a dagger. You can. Oh, you can. Yeah. So I think you can throw either rocks or a dagger at it to knock it out of the tree. Uh. You can use the climbing and then dexterity to pick it up, or you can use the fetch skill to uh, retrieve it. So there you go. That's you, that's that's the three different options mm-hmm. for three different different classes. And what's cool about it is. Although I'm a wizard, I could have climbed and picked it up, or I could have thrown stuff. But uh, you know, it's the optimal solution for the the magic user to use fetch. Mm. Now uh, we are in Arana's piece here, and there is a sh- shiny stone here, and it 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 actually does open. Did you guys open it by chance? I did not. Nope. <laughs> so that is, I believe, you can. I think as a war, I think you can use your strength to open it. I can't remember if the lock picks can open it, mm. but the magic user can definitely use the open skill to open it. And then inside of there, you get the trigger spell. The trigger spell is kind of weird. It kind of it like activates other magic in the area. Mm. So it's sort of like a detect magic, but it will actually like imagine there's a, a magical trap. It too. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Like a magical trap, it will like trigger the trap. Huh. Now, quick question, because we were talking about lock picking a little bit earlier. Did you try to pick your nose, Alamaxia? <laughs> no, I didn't. Oh, it's hilarious. So you can actually improve your okay. So what? you you what? take the lock pick, you put you take the lock picks and you put them on your nose. And if you're good, it'll be like, hey, you know, you hear a satisfying snick and you're you, you can breathe better and you actually can level up your skills. But oh if gosh. you're bad, it's like you mess up and you push the lock pick in your brain and die. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Wow. No, I uh I leveled my lock picking on the uh, on the healer's hut. Because yep. I noticed, um, I noticed when I tried to open it, it was bar- she said it was barred. Every time I tried to lockpick anything inside of the town when it yeah. was daylight, um, they were like, "Oh no, the guards will see." Uh. Yeah. So I went Don't and picked the healer's mm-hmm. hut and and got yep, my that's lockpicking a good way to, pretty to quick. grind. We are in the castle right now, and this is one of the coolest things. I remember doing this over and over as a kid. You go to the stables, and if you do it kind of before noon this stable hand comes out and says, hey, you looking for work? And if you're like, if you say yes, he'll make you take a rake and it takes maybe four hours and you basically, you know, shovel manure and you get uh, some strength and vitality and basically helps grind up your stats and gives you a little bit of money. Did you guys do this at all? I did, yeah. I learned about it before, I, you know, I stumbled across it. So mm-hmm. I came here and I tried, I couldn't figure out at first how to get the whole interaction to take place. And interestingly yeah. enough, I found a point where the guy wasn't visible, but you could click and interact with him and say like, Ooh, weird. yeah, like he wasn't on the screen at all, but I could interact with them. So uh, he, uh, I can't remember what it said, but it didn't, it didn't actually properly activate anything. It said he's out of sight, so you can't talk to him, but it was like uh, some, okay. like the top right corner of the screen almost. It was weird. But yeah, that- I, I love that jingle. It plays while you're, while you're raking the, the manure up. It's pretty good. <laughs> that was actually the room that uh, got me to quit my first playthrough because I had to play three characters to finally get into this game. What happened was I went and I did the chore. I shoveled everything, and then it was uh, right after I finished, it was nighttime, and they shut the castle, the gates. And I'm like, mm-hmm. wait, I, I can't get out, and I, I can't sleep because I, I couldn't, I didn't know where the rest uh, button was. That was one of the things I had to really mm. look up was oh, yeah. where all the, like, the controls were very to me very foreign and very not intuitive so i had to really look around for things and experiment but w- once i found that rest it was better i think i ended up dying trying to get into the barracks one time and yeah yeah that was yeah you you can try to break into the barracks and the guards will wake up and kill you i just wanted <laughs> a place to sleep <laughs> 
Did you, Lobos, did you uh, talk with the weapons master and do any training? There? I did. Yeah, I found him yeah. once. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if he shows up at a certain time every day, but I think it's at noon ah, okay. every day. Yeah, I stumbled across mm -hmm. him and he offered to, to train me for some money, I think. And yeah, increases your sword, swordsmanship that way. We've been talking a lot about different um, times. So it's worth noting that this game does have an in-game clock. And so certain events will only be active during those times. So for instance, the, the, uh, the main town will be boarded up at night and everyone will be gone. And so that's the time to do some thieving. But during the day, you know, everyone's out and you can talk to them. And I thought that was really cool. That, that, that sense of progression of time was, was really fun, especially when you think about as you're as you're exerting yourself, you know, like climbing up trees or throwing rocks or whatever, you eventually run out of stamina and then you have to rest for like an hour. Mm. And so that actually helps progress the time. And there's you can pretty much use as much time as is possible. In Quest for Glory 2, the game is actually has a set amount of days you mm. can go through, but there's no there's no uh, time limit for here. So you could grind up and get all your stats to the highest ever. That's cool. I wasn't sure about that. So I, I tried my best to get everything done like the yep. day I figured out what I could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. There's actually only one situation in this game where you are on a time limit. We'll get I, to I it. I died to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we are exploring the the forest a little bit and we found a fox that was a talking fox that was trapped in a, a uh, like a bear trap. This is an optional thing. Did you guys uh, find the fox and free him? I did. Yep. And when you free him, he's he basically tells you about the uh, Baba Yaga, which we haven't got to yet, and says uh, if you put a... Actually, no, I can't remember if he tells you... I think he tells, he tells you, you where to the get the gem. He tells, I think he tells oh, you the about dryad, the dryad. That's right. Mm. Yeah, that's right. It has nothing to do with Baba Yaga. He tells you about the... Um, the tree dryad that we need much later on in the game. Mm -hmm. And this is a game you can actually get in a situation where you cannot progress. Did you guys hit any of those situations? Uh, I, I like I almost did with the situation we were talking about earlier, where if you didn't have yeah. enough time to do the thing before the day ended or the day yeah. came. Yeah. Same but exact I did not. thing. Same yeah. exact thing happened to me. And I had a, I had a forking save file for that. Oh, good. Yeah, I did warn you guys. I have multiple save files here. Yeah. I want to go back to the healer's hut a little bit because she has a bunch of items. You know, she's got healing potions, mana potions, stamina potions, and they're actually just sitting out on the table, and you can actually steal them. Did anyone try that? What? No. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you steal them, she gets upset, and she kicks you out of the healer's hut, and you can no longer go in there for the rest of the game, Ooh. which is a big deal if you haven't got the dispel potion or the undead reagent yet. Yeah. So you can really mess yourself up if you do that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I noticed the... Well, basically, my my first day of the game, I I barely explored the town. I just I checked the inn, I checked the bar, the tavern, and then I immediately left and just started wandering. And um, I so I checked the healer hut and I saw that there was a, a, the undead unguent is called. And then I, I explored and I found the graveyard. And so I put those two and together two and two together really quickly. And then it was nighttime and I had nowhere to sleep. And that that was the first <laughs> real thing that I was like, oh, uh-oh. Like, what am I going to do about that? Because anywhere you try and sleep that's not a safe spot, yeah, you'll just you'll die. It, you'll die. So that was the first real challenge. And then once I got past that, I feel like things were more smooth, smoothly going. Cool. Did you, So we are now at the area with there's a big ogre and then inside the, the cave with the mm. ogres guarding is a bear. Did you guys kill the ogre or did you run around it? I killed the ogre. I ran around it and then came back for it later because it looked at me funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As a magic user, you can use the calm spell, which will actually like, you know, um, pacify it for five seconds or so. Uh, but eventually, yeah, I also killed it because it's carrying a chest, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think I actually got that open. I was able to okay, pick I think it you open have to... and it had, uh, it had a small handful of gold in it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, just some just some gold. I think I use the open spell. What's weird about the the magic stuff is you actually have to level up your usage in in the magic as well. The each so, individual. Uh, each individual. Oh. Uh, yeah. So it's like yeah, I got to a when you start and you try to open that chest that the ogre drops. It's like your skill in in in, in opening isn't good enough. Hmm. After I explored the cave a little bit, I headed over to Baba Yaga, and uh, there's a a uh, fence here that is made of like makeshift wooden poles or or sticks that have been sharpened, mm-hmm. and there is a <laughs> talking skull here, and he just wants to be like all the other skulls that have glowing orbs in his eye, right? <laughs> it's like. Hey, I, I I'll let you in here, but I want some glowing eyes too. So if you give me a glowing eye, I'll let you in here. And uh, and and there's actually a little bit ago we saw there was this big frost giant, and the frost giant he speaks uh, in in sort of sort of like a poem, mm-hmm. and so he's not very clear, but you can read and read kind of between the lines, and he says basically, hey, I've got. I've got an orb. If you want this glowing orb, just get me a handful of apples. And which turns uh, out to be you know, thirty. So, oh, was it only, I always thought it was fifty. Ah, I think it's thirty. Okay, I, because I think I actually had to end up looking it up because I gave him some apples and I gave him some apples and I was like, I, I must not. This might not, must not be it. And then I looked it up just to confirm, yeah. and I think thirty was the magic number. Yeah. So I, I'm just kind of roaming around here. I. Went to the Goblin Training Grounds. Did you guys spend any time there? Oh, I spent a lot of time there. <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, that, that place is so fun. So the way that one works is you first go there and there's one goblin and he's like in a bush and he picks up the bush and kind of you know shuffles over to you a little bit. And you kill that goblin and you get some money and then you can leave the screen and you go back in there and then you fight two goblins and then you fight three goblins and every time you go back there it's one more goblin i think the most it will go to up to is 10 did you guys I, get up that high i don't think i maxed it i i want to feel i feel like it was like 7 or 8 by the time i i wrapped up yeah. there i ne- i don't think i had near that many the most i ever saw in there was like three or four but i would i would hang out there for a little bit and see if another one would just kind of come in from the side but then i would for whenever i was trying to grind my combat i pretty much explored the forest so i mm-hmm. fought a lot of brigands along the way learned how to fight yeah. them pretty yeah. early on as the warrior why don't you tell us how the fighting system works here well i was gonna because... i was gonna ask because i tried a lot of things i tried to do some blocking i tried to do some dodging and I don't think I nailed it down effectively. So what my, I ended up just keeping my stamina high and just literally spamming attack. And it would basically <laughs> yeah. dice roll on whether or not the enemy would would parry it or dodge it. Some of the fights seemed more important to like on your timing of the, of the attack because it would kind of float away, come towards you, and then you would hit attack, and then you would wait for that. Um, but uh, if you are more familiar with that combat, it looked like you were doing some smooth dodge in there. Yeah, the combat is more or less a spam fest. I don't think it was ever really great, and it, it's kind of cool, you know. And I the idea of a point pl- point click adventure game that has this sort of meta game around it, where you're you're stabbing and then parrying mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then dodging and blocking. You can even cast spells in there, nice. but yeah, it doesn't f- it doesn't feel good. And <laughs> it's, a lot of times, the enemy will clearly miss you when they attack but you still get hit. Yeah, so I, I attributed I that a, a lot combat. more to how, how a game like Morrowind approached it, where you you know how to dodge, you're just not really good at it. You as a player know yeah, when okay. to click the button, but your character still didn't get the dodge. I played around a lot with the combat mechanics, and I feel like I, I, feel like I kind of really figured out how it worked by the end. And by the end, I did figure out that just spamming your stab and slash was the most effective thing to do. Yeah, that's what I found too. <laughs> Especially against the goblins and the brigands, they have a, a sequence where they'll keep hiding behind their shields. Mm-hmm. And so what they do is they they kind of do like a fake attack 
And then if you let that fake attack go, you know, don't just stand there, then they'll start with their real attack. And that's when you keep stabbing it over and over and over. Ah. But if you try to attack anytime else, they just keep hiding behind their shield. And so the brigands were very annoying. <laughs> and so a couple other enemies are like the t- a T-Rex, right? Uh, we had, there's like a manta ray. Yep. Yep. Um, what else did you, do you remember fighting anything else? Uh, uh, I definitely cleared out all the, the nighttime enemies there. There was like, um, well, the most basic was like, like either goblin or brigand, or there was like this kind of lizard enemy. And, uh, yeah, I can't remember what else was, was there at night. I think there was one more though that I'm thinking of. There's kind of like a tiger. It was like a tiger type thing, but or okay, a, a yeah. panther. Yeah. Yeah. There was oh, yeah, the, that's right. the yep. cheetar, which was the like that four legged kind of like a kind of like um this uh I'm trying trying to think of the right words like a centaur but a cheetah. Yeah. So <laughs> it was it was really weird and creepy. And then uh, there was that Soros, which was that uh that dinosaur guy that you found. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, then uh, I can't remember the name of it, but there was those manta ray guys in the in the middle of the night that would just like spawn in the middle of whatever room you're walking in, and those were the ones that would do the floating around mm-hmm, the room mm-hmm. to where you couldn't stab them, and those were especially annoying to fight because they shot lightning at you from a distance, and that lightning I found to be much harder to dodge than any other attack in the game. Yeah, yep, it was tough. Um, I never but- even tried dodging it. I basically just. <laughs> If I felt like the enemy was too strong for me, I would just grind until it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There, w- that's, there that's was great. one that. creature that I saw off the side of my screen one time, and I didn't get a good look at it, and I was going to ask you guys, but it was at the Mirror Lake. It ca- it uh, came in from the right side of my screen. I, I just mm. saw something for a brief moment, and I don't know what it was. Oh, you know what it is? Okay, uh, that is the Loch Ness Monster. It no. is an Easter egg. It's not a fighting thing. <laughs> You can, I think you can just look at it. Oh, and so yeah, they 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 have all sorts of little Easter eggs. I think they have even more of these in in the second one. Yeah. So uh, now that we're on on little Easter eggs, I got some trivia for you that's really fun. So this game actually was originally called Hero Quest, but what happened was in '89 there was a European board game that either came out before or had the license or something like that. And it was also called Hero Quest. Uh. So they actually uh, made the the company here, Sierra, change the name to Quest for Glory. Fun fact, I have that board game, Hero Quest. Oh, you do? I have it. And and it's it's complete. And uh, aside from the box... Uh, everything except for like one or two pieces are in near mint condition. I have all the oh, uh, awesome. all the uh, character figures, all the cards. It's, oh, I, I was so happy to find that at my parents. I actually found it a month ago. <laughs> oh, nice. wow. Congratulations. Also, some other fun trivia. You know, we talked about this game having three classes, but originally it was supposed to be actually four different races. It was going to be a thief gnome, uh, like a magic wielding elf, a human, which was just a jack of all trades, but the most interesting was an archer centaur. Oh, and, cool. But, you know, ultimately the cost for all that, especially the centaur, was prohibitively expensive. <laughs> so they went down to just a human character with three with three um, different classes. But we do s- see some centaurs in the game. In the town, there is uh, Hilde, I think. Heidi? Hilde? I think it's mm-hmm. Hilde. Which is, yeah, I think so. Or and then Hilda. she sells the apples. Yep, yep. And then the Hilda's father centaur, which is in the fields north of the city yeah. or the little town. And he doesn't really, t- there's not a whole lot of point of that, that guy. Really. Yeah. He just kind of tells you about his daughter, right? Yeah. He had a lot of talking points and he would, he, you would ask him about the Baron. He's like, I don't know anything about the Baron. Like, <laughs> All right, he dude, did have a, he did have a lot of information about the brigands though, and he really brought kind of an interesting point about how the brigand leader stopped the brigands from killing him and actually oh, yeah, brought him right. to safety. Yeah. So that brought, that brought kind of this to me in the story. It brought this sense of oh, are the brigands really bad? Is the leader a bad person? So yeah. that really put that seed in there. And, That's uh, a good point. I, I, I saw him as just more of a lore and story point rather than uh, functional. And the other thing, uh, a couple of people actually talk about the brigand leader. Uh, so first of all, they're always very quick to point out it, it's a male. 
Mm -hmm. right? They're like, oh, I couldn't see his face. And the second thing was a lot of times it was uh, shrouded by a... um, Like a hood. A hood, right? And so, you know, me playing the game many times, you catch on to that. But I don't know if you you folks kind of started to put two and two together there Mm -hmm. at all. Not until I figured out who it was, which I, I kind of had that figured out by, by the time I got to that point. But up until that point, I was like, uh, oh, so that, that was a fun twist. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some of the quests that you see in the Adventurers Guild. One of them is that the Baron's son is missing. And another one is that the Baron's daughter is missing. <laughs> and there's really no clues. And of course, there's also one about the, you know, the, the healer's ring is missing. And I'm trying to remember if there's any other quests that I are I think there is a uh, Mario is missing. <laughs> Mario is missing? <laughs> no. That's a game. Have you ever played Mario is missing? <laughs> I yes. have. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I have. No, I I think uh, I think I'm other sorry. quests might have been. <laughs> I think the other quests might have been um. Uh, defeat the brigand leader. Yeah. And, that's right. Yeah. And drive Baba Yaga from the land. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's right. That was that was uh, five quests here. Uh, just uh, uh, a couple seconds ago, I. You know, in this video, I, I tried to get as many interesting deaths as possible. <laughs> so, again, these, these these are Sierra games. Unlike the LucasArts games, the Sierra games would typically have many, many ways to die, and some of them are very interesting. One of them I attempted to throw. I knew this, but there's no way for my character to know this. I attempted to throw, throw a dagger at the Thieves Guild informant named Bruno. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you talk with Bruno at all, Almaxia? I gave him a gave him a couple silver to give me some information. Yeah. Uh huh. Did you give him the the thieves got guild sign? Uh I did not give him the thieves guild sign. I don't think. Okay. Um. I met him after I had joined the thieves guild and went through all of the uh, all of the thieves quest uh, side quest. So we're about halfway through the video. It's probably a good time for, for you to talk about a little bit about the Thieves Guild in general and the things that were special about the Thie- Thieves Guild. So take it away, Almaxia. All right. So with the Thieves Guild, uh, earlier we had mentioned that there are some side alleyways in uh, this little hamlet in Spielberg that might be dangerous. Well, the alleyway where the beggar is hiding out at, uh, if you're a thief, you go back there and you see the shiny in the, in the, back, of the back of the alley. And if you grab the shiny, a couple a couple thieves jump out and they're ready to ready to shank you. Oh. So they say, "Oh, get, better show me the sign." And this is where uh, the walkthrough for me, fortunately, came in came in handy. I was able to show him my lockpick, which is the sign. And they're like, "Oh, you're a th- well, actually you're a thief too." That's 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 not the thief sign. I'm surprised that that worked. Uh, so actually, the th- and this is more apparent when you read the manual. The thief sign actually is you put your thumb finger on your nose and wiggle the rest of your fingers. And so if you use your hand on yourself, <laughs> you'll perform the thief sign. It's interesting, though, that the lockpicks also work, though. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because I, I show him the lockpick, and he's like, oh, you're a thief, too. Well, we, we can't go. That, that's a shame that the first person we're trying to mug in months is a thief, too. And so you learn what the uh, Thieves Guild password is from them, and they, they go their merry way. Well, the Thieves Guild is in the downstairs of the bar, and that is being guarded by one of the big brute guys. Um, I can't remember his name. Uh, Crusher. I think it's just Crusher. Crusher. Yep. <laughs> uh, so you give him the, the password, and he lets you go down into the Thieves Guild. And down there is the, uh, the, the Thieves Guild master, and he's complaining about how they're always sending him beginners, and he never gets any good thieves. And he's throwing uh, daggers at a at a dartboard, which is a full uh, mi- mini game in and of itself. That was a lot of fun. Uh, oh, but he he's like, "Oh, you're not a thief. Yeah, you need to go talk to go talk to this guy behind the door. You got to pay pay the guy behind the door about fifty gold, uh, or not fifty gold, fifty silver to get a thief's license. And then, okay, now you're a full fledged thief. You can actually use our fencing services. Which there's uh, a couple points in this little hamlet where during nighttime." you are actually able to pick open the doors of a couple of the townspeople and loot their houses. During mm. the day, you try to pick them, like, the guards will see you. But at nighttime, 
you can go into the old lady's house. The old lady is rocking in her chair. Uh, you can go in there, and there's uh, a handful of things you can take. Uh, there's uh, some stuff in her purse. There's, I think, like a candelabra, a vase. There's a, a cat in there that if you stay stick around too long, the cat will you know, meow and wake up the old lady. And there's also a bird cage that if you lift the, lift the sheet on the bird cage, the bird will wake up the old lady, and she'll yeah. yell in. I think there's something under the rug also there. Did you get that? Um... So I think if you move the rug, you there's like so. a, a a trap door there that you can open up. I, it's been a while, but I thought one of the houses has that. I don't think I uh, I don't think I moved any rug in that one. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe it's in the other room. Not sure, but, but after uh, after leaving her house, I went to the uh, I went and found I could go into the sheriff's house, and it turns out that the sheriff. Uh, hit, his wife and Otto all lived together. So Otto, uh, Otto killed me a few times when I was looting that place because I made a, a little too much noise. But what was funny is there was a music box in there that whenever I clicked it on the first time, Otto came out, and I'm expecting him to, you know, kill me, throw me out or whatever, but he just comes out and shuts the music box and goes back to sleep. <laughs> so there was, there was some fun interactions with the characters and just stealing all their belongings, taking it back to the Thieves Guild, and got a pretty good chunk of money out of it. I was I was around 90 gold by the end of the first couple nights. Ooh. Yeah, and that's one that you actually use your your stealth mode because there's there's three different types of movement. There's normal walking, there's running, which is great if you just want to quickly move around, and then there's there's stealth, which you kind of... It looks really goofy. It looks like you're hunched over and your arms are outstretched and you kind of waddle <laughs> as you walk um but yeah you you use that to sneak around the um you know the houses but i I love that because those are areas that lobos and i just don't have the opportunity to explore mm-hmm. because we were not thieves so there was no option for that so it gives you a little bit of a reason to go back with some of the different characters and and play yeah, I definitely would like to play through this as a as a magic user to to experience how you do the puzzles like that. Uh, like we were saying earlier, even though I was a thief, there were some puzzles I'm pretty sure I approached from more of a warrior strength perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, about Baba Yaga because I did get the glowing orb from the Frost Giant. I went in to Baba Yaga, and it says "Old Hag." She's green, and she immediately turns you into a toad. And then she turns you back into a human and says, hey, you know, I'll let you live if you pull out a mandrake root for me, from me. And I think she more or less puts a geist on you where she says, if you don't get it to me by midnight, you will, you will die. Uh-huh. Now, one of the things about this is in order to get the mandrake root at midnight, you have to be in the cemetery at midnight and there are ghosts there and ghosts will basically kill you. The minute you walk into that screen, if you don't have the undead, what was it? Undead. Unguent. Unguent. I don't know what that word is, but it's very fancy. (laughs) And you can only get that if the healer's hut is open, which means if you didn't already have the potion and you happen to go to Bobby Aga's place late in the night, there's no way to actually get that unguent because the healer's shop would have been closed. Yeah. So you can get yourself in a situation where there's no way to get that mandrake root. Mine, I got was, my, I, mine, mine was very, very slim. Like it basically ended up that I was trying to complete it. And uh, like if I was walking, I couldn't make it, but then I had to reload and then I just sprinted and like just in time made, made it to get there at midnight. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I had and then you the go up- unguent, but for me, I had accidentally pulled the mandrake root earlier in that day, yeah. and it oh. doesn't respawn for like two or three, like two or three in-game days. And I was, I was mm-hmm. wondering, is it ever going to respawn? <laughs> so I, I was actually prepared to re-roll another new character after that. <laughs> oh, no. But, but luckily it did respawn. I was able to complete it. Very good. One of the items that we need for this potion, this dispel potion that the dryad told us about you know the dryad was the the thing that fox told us about earlier so the dryad tells you to make a dispel potion and you're not quite sure why you need the dispel potion but she says you need a couple different items and one of them is the seed from these flowers and i distinctly remember this seed from the flowers 
the flowers shoot out these the seed. They're kind of playing hot potato with the seed, and you have to try to get it. This was the first part I got really stuck in the game as a kid, and I remember I I tried to call Sierra one nine hundred hotline for the answer, and I was stuck on this one forever. So let's get your solution. How did you guys figure out how to get the seed from these flowers? Um. Well, my first. I went onto that screen. I knew I needed to get that seed. Uh, uh, I'm a fighter, so I was like, all right, well, let's see if I can attack the flower. And you can. You can smash, like, the first one. And I was like, all right, well, that one didn't have the seed, so I'll just smash them all. And I get the <laughs> seed. You take it back to the dryad. you could do that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You could take it to the dryad, and you're like, here you go. And uh, and I don't remember exactly how, but you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned that you smashed them all. And she's like, what? What did you do? <laughs> And then she kills you because she, oh, she's, oh, wow. she's, you know, you're supposed to uphold nature and protect it and everything. And, but she's like, yeah, yeah. So she kills you. And then at that point, I started really, uh, I, I started trying everything, but I did ultimately have to look up uh, a solution to it. So this is why I really love that we played this game because, again, I've played this game and beat it upwards of 10 times, and I've never done that. <laughs> so it's cool to see that there's still more for me to discover. How did you solve it, Alamaxia? Uh, because I did all that wonderful climbing outside of the healer's hut, I was able to climb up next to one of the flowers and just my character held his hands up in the air until the seed just uh, went to his hand. Oh, that's awesome. Yep, I, that's I, one of them. You could... Oh, God. I was going to say, I, I did have to stand there for probably, I mean, 30, 40 seconds because the seed would bounce between a couple other flowers, but it wasn't like this triggered it to, co to go my way. I still had to wait. Y yep. Uh, there are a couple other ways to get it. I used fetch and you can also use a rock. You can very well time the, the shooting of the seed from pod to pod and throw a rock at it and knock it out of the air. That, that uh, is what I ultimately had to do. Or okay. when I looked it up, that's what it said to do. So I did it that way. I just saved the Baron. And the way that you do that is we were talking earlier about the cave that there was a bear in. Um, <laughs> so kind of funny to think about there's a uh, a bear in the cave. Mm -hmm. So bear, Baron, I don't know. If, I don't know if that well, was the uh, intended or not. Baron's son, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So the Baron's son is actually the bear. And you can kind of tell there's something weird because it has purple eyes and it has this weird chain attached to it. And if you go, you can feed the bear or you can cast the calm spell to bypass the bear. And then if you go behind the bear, there's a kobold. And it reminds me very much of the Lord of the Rings, if you think of um, Golem, right? It's just like this grayish looking, it literally looks like Golem. So I always associated it <laughs> with that. And he has a key uh, around his neck, I believe. And there's a couple ways to get the key. How did you guys get it? I stabbed him a bunch of times. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> So I went in there all sneaky stealthy and he threw some lightning balls at me and I had to run away for a while. But my second attempt in, I was able to get in and actually steal the key from him. Nice. But I, uh, uh, go ahead. I was going to say back at that bear, I did want to note that you can run past him, just straight run past him. That's true. If you go off to the side a little bit, you can certainly do that. That's how I was. That's the only way I was able to get. It. I didn't oh, know about the, uh, I didn't know about the ration. At yeah, I, yep. I fed him a ration on my playthrough. The, uh, the the way I got that key right was, you know, I used the fetch skill, but I don't know if my skill just wasn't high enough because it woke him up. And then we had a, a magic battle to the <laughs> death. And I was shooting flame darts at him and he was shooting lightning bolts at me. And I did kill him and I got the key. Also, there was a chest there. Did you guys find the chest? I read it's that hidden. in a guide, but I couldn't find it still because it's invisible. That's what they it's said. It's invisible. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the thief can actually find it, right? Uh, I didn't. Did you find, find it, Alamax? I didn't find it because I was not able to kill him. Okay. Oh, yeah. Interesting. It is, it is trapped. And I think that there's, I, I can't remember if there's actually anything in it or you just try to open it and it blows up and kills you. But as a mage, I used the trigger on it and the trigger blew up the trap and, and oh, cool. blew up the chest of smithereens. Now here's the, now technically all classes can go here, but this is really the wizard's place. It's a big wizard's tower and it contains two individuals, Erasmus and 
his familiar Fenris, although it's sort of ambiguous. So Fenris is this rat, and Erasmus is this very traditional wizard, like purple robes, wizard's hat, and everything. But they kind of make it ambiguous, is like, is the rat the familiar of of Erasmus, or is it the other way around? Is the human the familiar of the rat? Mm. The so I don't know if you guys got fun. to this place and talked to him. Yeah, I didn't actually play go and all here. that was great. I um when you you, you well you enter the area and there's kind of these comical like signs that pop up that are like do not continue and then like the next one's like certain death if you enter and it's like a stop sign shaped and I was like okay yeah. and that was kind of early in the playthrough and I was like I'll come back later but I didn't actually okay. end up making my way back here. Well, now you get to see what's there. Yeah. When you get to the gate, they do the Monty Python thing. It's like, what that. is your name? What is your <laughs> quest? And th- and then they'll ask you. Uh, uh, they'll pull from a couple different questions. So one of them is like, what is your favorite color? One of them is what is the average, um, what swan speed? Is the average wind speed velocity of an unladen swallow. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you get, you come here and if you're a wizard, well, actually what you need to have is all the wizard spells. So I think there was like seven or eight different spells you have to have collected. And if you're that, if you have all those, you get to play the wizard game. Oh, no. This is actually so cool. isn't really that fun. The way that this works uh, is it's a little complicated to figure out on your own. But if you if you look at it, there's two flames. There's a blue flame, or they're elementals, a blue elemental and then a pink elemental. Mm. The blue elemental is yours, and the pink elemental is Erasmus's. And what you have to do is you have to you have to pick up rocks and move them to unblock passages, or you have to like move ladders. It's it's kind of like Lemmings, if you yeah. guys remember that game, where you have to like, all right, I want to, I got to cross this chasm, put a ladder there, and now he can cross. So, it's just a bunch of like using your different s- spells to get your elemental from one place to the other faster than Erasmus. And when you do that, you get this spell called Razzle Dazzle, oh. and that blinds everyone. Not super useful, but I went here just so I could show off the uh, mm-hmm. the game. That's cool. But you do learn a little bit about a magic mirror. And the, one thing I forgot to mention is when you go back and you give Baba Yaga that mandrake we were talking about earlier, she says, thanks, don't come back here again. And there's a little text blurb that's like, I should really repay her the favor of turning me into a frog at some point mm. oh. and so that's kind of a clue like oh i should come back here and turn her into a frog and then in talking with erasmus she talks or uh, erasmus talks about a magic mirror that can reflect spells yeah, yeah. and so that's sort of a hint that you need that magic mirror but they can't remember where it is so at least that gives you a little bit of an idea that hey there is a magic mirror that might be able to do what we d- want to do here Nice. And uh, we just went back to the the tavern here. Alamax, I gave you a little bit of a clue. Did you read the note here and find the secret meeting? Yeah, I, I had already found that meeting. Um, and I, I did this and I watched the meeting and uh, B there, Bernard, killed me a, a few times before I figured oh, out yeah, what I had that. to do with the meeting, uh, which I, I was on the other side of the screen from what you're showing. Uh, but I uh, ended up just throwing a dagger at the guy at, when he yeah. when he uh was alone and then when yeah then there's went two guys there's there's b uh b aka bruno. bruno he was the one where i was talking about earlier he was like a thieves guild contact mm-hmm. and he's talking to a uh, nobody and you learn about the secret passage the way to get to the brigands hideout and there's uh he basically says you got to say the hidden gossip key to the um to the secret passage before you enter it otherwise you'll get killed by a troll right alamaxi i think you got killed by the troll there right quite a number of times i (laughs) i tried to fight him a few times got him down about half health but in the end i was able to to figure out that instead of just walking into the room and trying to fight the troll i could talk to the rock door that i was going through and give him the password because i was approaching it wrong i had to i had to give him the password then open the door <laughs> yep so if you do it the other way lobos, around did, he just gets mad hmm. yep lobos did you fight him or did you use the password uh i killed the 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 troll when the you troll. enter yeah in in true warrior that's story. right that's right now, i figured I had now to. the hidden 
Hidden Gossiki is sort of a, you know, a, a sort of a play on words because it sounds a lot like hide and go seek. <laughs> so that's that's a little bit of a little fun little pun there for us. So we're approaching the end of the game. We are trying to infiltrate the brigands' lair. There is a rock there. Again, there's a couple ways to open the rock. You can find a key. You can use the the open spell, or you can lock pick it. And then you go into the cave. And if you say the hidden gossip key, you can go into this cave, and you know, no problems. But I guess uh, Lobos, you fought him. Yeah. I uh, at first I I fought and then died, and then I was like, that's that's not going to stand. I went and gr- and grinded some some of those uh, <laughs> goblins. Came back, and kicked his butt. Nice. Also, uh, I want to make <laughs> uh, this is definitely where the game, the real quest for glory begins, because this is where I really had to start looking up and other because there's so many ways to die and there become a lot of like yeah. real timed events yep. that you have to complete. Yeah, you. It's like some of these rooms you have to do very specific things at very specific times, or else you will die. And it's like it's one of these things where you may not have confidence that you have all the items you need to actually progress. So sometimes it's it's actually worth just like, all right, do I actually have what I need to move on in this area? Yeah. And so there's the Minotaur. His name's Toro. And uh, I guess you probably fought him, Lobos, right? Yeah, he was easy compared to the troll. Uh, Alamaxi, what did you do? Um, did you I sneak past him. I fought him a couple of times um, and then I had to revert to save files and fight through them. But a- after a while, I was able to sneak past him and just climb over the yep. wall. And so. then as a magic user, I uh, I used the calm spell and he kind of put him to sleep and then I used the open to open the door. So, yeah, we all solve this different ways. Getting through that gate was really confusing for me because I could climb and I had a good climb score, but nothing would ever happen. And I was so confused. And oh, it ended yeah. up you have to like try to move into the door like i think a that's twice right or yeah, something. you have to get very close to yeah, it and then he runs and just jumps into it and it breaks <laughs> the wall down but because all these other options would make noise and uh, alert the guards and then you would get killed but that yeah. doesn't because reasons <laughs> <laughs> after that you do this little sequence where you have to you have to deal with the with a bunch of guards coming at you. You have to put a door to stop some guards, and then some other guards come into the room. You have to topple a candelabra to make them not um, come down a certain path, and then you use a um, a chandelier. You use like the rope that that ties a chandelier to the ceiling, and you use that as a uh, like a vine to swing and and Tarzan your way into all three of the guards, which. Uh, look very similar to Larry, Moe, and Curly mm-hmm. from the Three Stooges. Yeah. <laughs> and the way I you take them out make... is just very, very Three Stooges-like as well because the chandelier oh, yeah. falls on them and traps them all <laughs> inside of that, that circle ring. Mm-hmm. And then you go in and you find Yorick. And there was this was the, the court wizard. And I'm not sure if you guys realized who Yorick was, but a couple people were talking about about this guy also disappearing along with uh, Elisa. I think that's her name. Elsa. The Baron's daughter. Elsa. The Baron's daughter. And what you learn from him is he came here to keep Elsa safe. Mm-hmm. But he's, he's, he's kind of a joker, right? He's got this fun house where some of these doors are false doll- doors and they, they kind of knock you all around. Yeah, that room was uh, fun, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to the last house or the last room in the castle. And this is the part that you can get stuck if you don't have the dispel potion. Elsa, who's mind controlled, or I guess she's not necessarily mind controlled, but under the effects of a spell, will just stab you. And so this is one of those where y- you may need to restart the game if you don't have save files that are before entering the brigand lair because there's, once you go into the brigand lair you cannot go back and get that dispel potion mm. but you throw that dispel potion on, on elsa and she turns back to her normal self and yorick comes into the room and says great let's go ahead and get out of here and, and you know they teleport out and they leave you for the guards they're like oh you know there's a secret passage over here and again if you don't pick up the mirror that's sitting in the room it's like a little hand mirror. If you don't pick up the room, 
or you don't pick up that mirror, there's no way to go back and get it and you won't be able to beat the game truly. So hopefully you guys all picked up the mirror the first time, right? Yeah, I talked with enough people and they gave me enough hints that said, hey, the, the brigands have the mirror. And I was I was ready to, to look for it in her room. I think even Yorick mentions that that it's sitting yep. in there on the desk. So, yeah, he, he does allude so to that. So I did get the mirror, but you know what? I don't I didn't do the Baba Yaga quest. I did Oh you didn't go back. No, I didn't she go didn't back and beat the game. Well oh. I got the I got an ending. <laughs> Uh, Wait, did you get the ending where they're all lined up? I got an, because that's the end of the quest. I don't think you beat this. I game got an once. ending where we fly off in a magic carpet. Oh yeah, that's the ending. Now, okay, I thought, huh, that's weird. Oh, you know what? You probably. I wonder if you went to the castle. That's probably yeah, what, yeah. yeah because probably went to the castle. Her, so I was like, okay, I'll go yeah. back, and then yeah, I think they have the celebration, and and it ends it. But that's so, so interesting. Huh. So Lobos, yeah, so because you, could, you killed Tauros, was he there in your ending? <laughs> I don't, you know, I didn't uh, make note of him, so either I just didn't see him, or he actually wasn't there. <laughs> well, now I'm gonna have to find out. Yeah, right. So, Crazy. what you do with that magic mirror is you go back to Baba Yaga, and she tries to cast the frog spell on you, and then you hold up the magic mirror, the spell reflects and turns her into a frog, and then you get out of there, and the hut flies away and you go back mm -hmm. to the castle and there's a celebratory scene some good fanfare and yeah you run out you you fly away with abdullah who we talked about very very briefly at the beginning uh to the next place mm -hmm. uh which i think is shapir mm -hmm. and and what I, I love about this is the Game allows you to save out your character and then you can import them into the next game. And you can do that all the way up through Quest for Glory 5. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. like like the only game series that I knew that did that was like Mass Effect or maybe Dragon Age yeah. 2. Like, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. So that is Quest for Glory. Uh final thoughts from both you guys. I quite enjoyed it. I like I like I said before, I my first kind of more point and click adventure style like this. I've done I've done other different point and click adventures, but not ones where I had to choose like walk here or interact with this or talk with this or all these different little options. I enjoyed it. I do want to play the next one to see really where the series started going. Um, and I really I'm really not sure how far the series went or until what point it was like, uh, that's kind of when the series dropped off. Mm. So I actually think four is one of the best games and is narrated by oh, I forget his name, but he's a guy that played Gimli in Lord of the Rings. Ooh, really? Yeah, huh, no way. So three and four are really, really good. Five, unfortunately, is is the start of that whole 3D era where everyone was making games in 3D and it just didn't, it it so didn't translate. But yeah. if you have a passing interest in, in, in the Quest for Glory series, I highly recommend checking out three and four. Uh, those I think those are where the game starts to shine. Do you think you need to play through two first, or does I it, think it's worth it? It they, does you the know, plot kind of continue? You, you kind of it does. Yeah, you some of the same characters will emerge in in the second one. You'll meet a character that you'll talk to more in the third one, and I think they do that with the, from three to four as well. So you get to meet some recurring characters. You have a better appreciation for mm. the lore behind it. Okay, that's cool. I will say by the end of the game, I think I only had a score of like. 375 out of 500 so <laughs> okay there's a lot okay. of stuff that yeah. i i did not yeah. do especially with the, the baba yaga quest that was probably a good chunk yeah i think i think getting rid of baba yaga was about 150 points in and what? of itself yeah it, it's a big big uh, score uh the increase well. there well, that was Quest for Glory 1, So You Want to Be a Hero. We really hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. I love this game so much. And uh, and again, I think it's worth picking up today if you uh, want some cool RPG slash adventure game goodness. So uh, I wanted to give a special shout out to all of our, our Patreon supporters for the Saturday Morning Gaming Show. Your support helps keep the show alive. And if you're interested in helping support the show, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Gaming Show to learn more.
Well, we've been really good guys in all these games we've been playing. I think it's about time we uh, shifted up here. What are we going to do next? <laughs> oh, no. We have been very heroic. And Dungeon Keeper was one of the first games that I can really think of that shifted that mindset to be like, what if you were the bad guy and you were the ones creating the dungeons that those pesky heroes kept trying to come in and destroy? And I know Lobos loves this game. Right? I am a huge fan of Dungeon Keeper. I had the like 200 page manual back in the day, read all the things. They have all sorts of descriptions and all the characters and, and stuff in there. Okay, it wasn't maybe 200 pages, maybe like 50 pages, <laughs> but it was a booklet, you know, when they had really good yeah. manuals. And it, I would take that to school and just read it in class and ignore everything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was awesome, man. The, the game's so, so like detailed and complex for its time and uh, mm -hmm. yeah Dungeon Keeper and awesome. i think lobos you might have pointed out that there was a unofficial fan patch for this game is that mm -hmm. right yeah and there's yeah. there was a guy who was putting out multiple revisions of updates to the game in terms of like bug fixes and visuals and uh he he said that he was stepping away from it for a while but the community has picked it up and they're still doing work on it and releasing new updates yeah. And so we'll be playing with that one. And in the chat room for the Dungeon Keeper in our Discord, we will definitely post links there. Do you recommend to use that? Because, again, this is one of those early 3D games mm -hmm. that looks kind of like a muddy mess. But this <laughs> actually helps clean it up a little bit. So it's a little bit more palatable. Yeah, the main thing is the resolution. So if you can just get yep. that to, to try and improve that past whatever 320 by 240 or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah um yeah, that'll really help uh it if you can get past those graphics like the game runs really smoothly well yeah. at least in my experience runs smoothly yeah, yeah yeah um and has a, there's just so much to it that's it's really awesome it's really unique it is a lot of fun so next month should be a lot of yeah. fun Sadly, we've reached the end credits of this episode and we wanted to thank everyone for listening to us on the podcast we release a new podcast monthly, so make sure to follow and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google, or whatever your platform of choice is. If you have any feedback, we would love to hear from you. Shoot us an email at SaturdayMorningGamingShow at gmail.com. Or follow us at, on Twitter at SaturdayMGaming. And a special shout out to Technoax for the intro music of this episode. For Saturday Morning Gaming, I'm Alamaxia. And I'm Lobos. And I'm the Fat Wizard. We'll see you in July with Dungeon Keeper for the PC.